Next, Stephen Wiviot is joined by Dr. Darren McGuire, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. They discuss state of the science, glycemic control, and cardiovascular disease. Welcome, Darren. Thanks, Steve. So, Darren, I think we all think of diabetes as predominantly a disease of blood sugar control. We have learned over the years that the control of blood sugar may or may not be related to specific adverse outcomes. Can you talk a little bit about where we have come in terms of understanding how glycemic control impacts cardiovascular disease specifically? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a common perception that diabetes is hyperglycemia. That's the definition of the disease. But I think as we've all realized as the last couple of decades of data have emerged, that diabetes is much more than hyperglycemia. And from a cardiologist's perspective, you know, we've got to focus on blood pressure and lipids, antiplatelet therapies. And then once we do well with all of those, what's left behind is the hyperglycemia. We still have a residual risk associated with diabetes from a cardiovascular perspective. That is, patients with diabetes have two to four-fold increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, and once developed, have a two to three-fold increased risk of having adverse outcomes secondarily. And so there's still a residual risk of diabetes in what stands now after blood pressure, lipids, and antiplatelet therapy still is hyperglycemia. We have high triglycerides and low HDL. So whether any of these three are targets of therapy remains unproven. We've assumed forever that hyperglycemia was a focus of therapy for type 2 diabetes. And for microvascular disease, that probably still stands. But I think we're more uncertain presently than we've ever been about the role of glucose control specifically for atherosclerotic vascular disease. And is that different for type 1s or for juvenile onset diabetes than it is for the standard type 2s that we'll see in an adult practice? It's a great point of distinction. Probably about 97 percent of the prevalence of diabetes in the world is type 2 diabetes. And so there's an important minority of diabetic patients that are type 1. And we've tended, especially in the cardiology realm, to lump them together. And they're quite different. You know, the type 1 diabetic patient is insulin dependent and they have complete lack of insulin. Their atherosclerotic risk profiles and their manifestation of disease are quite different. We actually have a paper in review, an AHA scientific statement, summarizing the differences of type 1 versus type 2 diabetes from a cardiovascular perspective. And so I think what we want to focus on today probably is primarily type 2 diabetes. Glucose control and insulin treatment is imperative in type 1 diabetes, a little less clear in type 2. If we look back a few years, perhaps when we were in our training, there were only a few options for therapies for type 2 diabetes. It seems that there has been a substantial expansion in those options and some bumps along the road in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. So it seems to have changed the way that we're addressing diabetic agents. Could you talk a little bit about how we got to where we are now? Yeah, so specifically you're referring to the regulatory landscape of how we're bringing these new compounds to market. And you're exactly right. It's very humbling to think back in the early 90s when I entered internship, we had two drugs available. I have to think back to even remember that, but we had insulin and sulfonylureas. It was only 1995 that we brought metformin and alpha-glucosidase inhibitors on board. So in 1995, we had four therapeutic classes to treat type 2 diabetes, none of which had undergone large-scale randomized clinical trial testing because we had a fairly vulnerable patient population and an imperative to bring some agents to market to treat them. You know, you fast forward to today where we have, I think, last count, 37 different approved formulations of drugs for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in the U.S. representing what I think is 13 different classes of agents. So we're living in a land of plenty for therapeutic options. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the regulatory landscape has changed is we no longer have the time-sensitive urgency to bring drugs to market for these patients. We have lots to choose from. Now we can pause and actually begin to ask, are the new ones better than the old ones? And the existing ones comparing against each other would be useful. You know, add to that, as you suggested, some safety signals, cardiovascular and otherwise. Almost every drug on the market has some safety signal that we have to consider. And we don't know exactly how to put that into a risk-benefit ratio because we've never truly proven clinical outcomes benefit with these. So we don't really have a quantitative benefit of any of the drugs above and beyond the speculation that a given level of glucose control will modify microvascular disease. So you add the safety signals and the plethora of drugs available, and you add to that the diabetes epidemic and its morbidity and mortality consequences where we simply can't continue to guess how best to treat these patients. It's 10% of the U.S. population has this disease, and so we need to more rigorously know how these patients are going to do long term. 
And finally, the discordance in the trial data, not just the safety signals, but trial after trial showing a little bit better influence of glucose control on outcomes, and some trials showing more intensive glucose control don't improve outcomes, and even some adversity signals. So hemoglobin A1c per se doesn't truly predict outcomes anymore. So we need to measure what happens to people, how they live, and their complications. It sounds like as we're thinking about diabetic agents, we're thinking about them more broadly as opposed to simply what they do to blood sugar. What about hypoglycemia with these drugs? How does that play into potential outcomes? The later drugs have come onto market to fulfill the unmet clinical need of drugs to treat blood glucose that have lower or even no risk of hypoglycemia. So some of the newer compounds have very little hypoglycemia. You know, the sulfonylureas and insulin treatment are both robustly associated with hypoglycemia. What each individual hypoglycemic event does to the patient or their in aggregate remains unknown. If people have serial hypoglycemic events, we don't know what it does to their neurocognition. We know the dementia is increased in patients with diabetes. Maybe some of that is iterative hypoglycemia expels. But hypoglycemia in and of itself isn't just the only adverse side effect we need to avoid, but it is an important one and certainly one patients don't like. And then add to that insulin and sulfonylureas, especially weight gain going hand in hand with the hypoglycemia. So lots of adverse effects we need to try to get away from in our new drug development. So speaking of new drug development, now that there's a recognition of some of these potential issues related to metabolic agents like diabetes drugs, What's the hurdle that needs to be achieved or what makers of new drugs need to show about their drugs in order for them to be approved? It used to simply be that you could lower glucose, but now that's not enough. Is that right? Right. It's still necessary to lower glucose, so let's get that clear. People have jumped straight to the outcomes, but we still need to have proof of concept that the agent actually does have metabolic effects. Above and beyond that, as you know, in the U.S. and also in parallel in Europe and around the world, the regulatory agencies are now requiring proof of cardiovascular safety. So these drugs don't have to prevent cardiovascular disease, but they have to be safe within a statistical margin of certainty so that we can assume, again, that the microvascular disease outcomes will be improved and to make sure it's not at the expense of incrementing cardiovascular or other risk. And so on that basis, every new drug coming to market, every oral agent is having to undergo cardiovascular outcomes trial to exclude no more than a 30% incremental risk for cardiovascular outcomes. And a lot of people have interpreted that as to we would accept a drug that increases risk by 30%. And I'd like to just clarify that it's the upper confidence limit that's 30%. And that's based almost entirely on a point estimate of 1.0, meaning the drug does no good but no harm in the overall study population. Right. So ideally, the drugs improve cardiovascular outcomes, but they need to be acceptably safe. As we're talking about the state of the art here, maybe we could just run through a couple of what you think are the drugs that are far enough down the line to be relevant to the general cardiologist. What do you think in the next several years will be the newer classes of drugs that will make it or not make it based on these guidance? There are something like 33 novel targets being probed presently in drug development for type 2 diabetes. But let's just talk about the ones that are really proximal to the clinical space or actually in the clinical space. So First are the GLP-1 analogs. These are injectable drugs, starting with exenatide, which was twice daily injection, then liraglutide, which is a once daily injection, and now exenatide has a long-acting formulation approved for once weekly injection. These drugs are very impressive from a glycometabolic perspective. They don't cause hypoglycemia. They potentiate endogenous glucose-appropriate insulin secretion. They also induce weight loss. They have some favorable effects on blood pressure and lipids, and so all the signals are going in the right direction. And as you know, a number of large-scale outcomes trials are underway with, I think, now four of these drugs. In parallel with those are the DPP-4 antagonists. These are oral agents that inhibit the enzyme that breaks down endogenous GLP-1, and so they, through a tablet, can potentiate endogenous GLP-1 action. They don't have nearly the weight reduction or nearly the glucose-lowering effects of the GLP-1 somewhere in between, but they're well-tolerated in their tablets, so patients can avoid injections. And then most recently, the SGLT2, this is a sodium glucose transporter in the kidney. And so there are antagonists to this transporter in the proximal tubule of the kidney that inhibits glucose reuptake. And so it forces patients to spill glucose even at physiologic concentrations into the urine, creating a glucose sump, if you will. Now, that lowers blood glucose, but importantly, it's also three to 400 calories of caloric loss daily, and so there's weight loss associated. And lastly, it's an osmotic diuretic, and so there's a little bit of a blood pressure effect. So these drugs are just now coming toward the market as well, and so these are once-daily oral agents as well. And again, no hypoglycemia. 
Right. Well, it sounds like from when we trained and there were just a couple drugs, a lot more on the way. I think this has been an extremely helpful summary to understand how we got here and where we might be going in the future. For all of us in cardiology, it's quite apparent that patients with diabetes are a major part of our practice and will be a growing part. So I appreciate your educating us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.